And Doug, if I mess up the order, I'm sorry. Yeah, totally. I, my handwriting, I can't, I, I'm having a hard time deciphering what order, because I was like, man, my handwriting is so bad. Yeah. Miss Andrews uh, would be appalled. All right, everybody. Um, welcome to week three of the Midwest Culturally Inclusive Conference. Tonight's session is entitled on decolonizing US education. We do have some community standards during this conference. Um, Kaden is going to link the full text of this in the chat, um, but I do want to express a few of them here. Please obtain consent before taking any photos or screenshots or copying text and generally sharing content that is not your own. Please, um, well, we are using a webinar version tonight, as you may see um, as a participant, and so you are already muted, um, but a great way to engage with this conversation um, and ask any questions tonight is using the Zoom chat or the Q&A button that you should see um, on your Zoom taskbar. Um, that's a great way to engage with our presenters. This is going to be, um, yeah, more of a presentation ver ver um, version tonight than a dialogue. So please engage uh, in the chat or in whichever ways you like. We do have live closed captioning available through all of our sessions during the Midwest Culturally Inclusive Conference. Um, you might be seeing some live captionings on your screen now. If you do not, um, please use your Zoom taskbar and click the CC button. Um, this may be located under the more button as well and click view live transcript. If you're having any difficulties with this, um, please message us using the Zoom chat, any of your panelists or hosts this evening, and we'll be happy to help you. The QR code that you see on your screen directly links to our Campus Climate YouTube page where we have posted all of the available recordings that we've had so far during the Midwest Culturally Inclusive Conference. Most of the sessions during this conference are being recorded to make it as accessible as possible for those who cannot attend live. Um, we do post these recording links in Whova, but they will live on our Campus Climate YouTube page as well once the conference is over. Um, if you have any questions this evening, like I said, please engage and use the Zoom chat either publicly or privately. We do have some hosts and co-hosts with you here this evening. We also monitor our Campus Climate email account. Um, it will be monitored throughout tonight's session and throughout the entire conference. And lastly, I would like to introduce tonight's session, um, which is entitled On Decolonizing U.S. Education. Um, this is being presented to us tonight by Doug Adams and Shan Sappleton. U.S. education is hardly divorced from systemic societal inequalities. Utilizing the cases of the English-speaking Caribbean and post-apartheid South Africa de decolonization efforts, we engage the settler coin concept to interrogate the popular notion that we can achieve systemic change in the U.S. without fundamentally transforming the education system. What lessons might the U.S. glean from other decolonized efforts in the Caribbean and South Africa? How have the instrumental ideas and work of Caribbean and South African scholars and educators shaped and advanced a decolonization vision? Answering these questions requires considering the overall goals of the U.S. education system relative to advancing a large decolonization project. I will now turn things over to Doug and Chan. Thank you so much for the, the wonderful introduction, Emily and Kaden. Um, I'm Doug Adams. And I'm Shan Sappleton in the Political Science Department here at uw Platteville. And uh, as Emily stated, our talk is on decolonizing US education, lessons from the Caribbean and South Africa. Um, so today, uh, for, for in our brief time that we have with y'all, is uh, we'd like to introduce the problematic, which is the decolonizing the US education system, uh, briefly discuss methodological concepts such as colonialism, settler colonialism, decolonization, and the settler coin concepts, 
Uh, and then we will switch gears to talk about the role of education in the decolonized process. And then a look at uh, instances from the Caribbean and South Africa so that we can uh, learn from them and what we can glean from them to establish a more decolonized process here at the US education system. And then we'll move to our conclusion and questions. And just in terms of like how the project came about, um, we all lived through the horrible summer that was 2020. And um, what that did was bring attention, primarily the killing of um, George Floyd. Um, what that did was to bring to the forefront some of the racial issues that are always, always on the surface. But um, generally when it comes to issues related to African-American or marginalized communities within the United States, those become highlighted, um, those instances become highlighted and prominent. And um, while there were calls, for example, to decolonize or to bring changes to the law enforcement, right? There were also calls within our educational system to, um, to, to bring about meaningful changes there. What are the ways in which through our education system, we can have a more just and better society? So what are the ways in which society can lead to better institutions and education can then facilitate a better society? So how can we truly move towards some of the efforts that have been established for anti-racism within our educational system um, when they are still fundamentally grounded in Eurocentric norms and values, right? Um, so our idea here that we are like we're wanting to advance is how can education itself be decolonized using both decolonizing practice um, from other decolonization efforts or decolonial efforts around the world um, and how that can inform how we can decolonize colonize the US education system. So just to give a, be, a brief uh, background, um, the role of the United States education system since the, I guess, establishment, especially with the establishment of uh, normalized uh, education through Horace Mann, is that there's a favoring of Western Eurocentric hegemony. What we think here is, is that the sort of idea around uh, the privileging of Western thoughts over indigenous thought, over other forms of uh, epistemologies uh, as, as part of the settler coined concept that we will discuss later. Uh, and oftentimes the, the sort of diversity uh, initiatives that are taken up by um, ins uh, institutions of education and institutions of higher education are often tokenistic. Uh, so instances of resistance that we've seen in the past uh, several years include the 1619 project, uh, and then instances of backlash or reactionary backlash against projects, this is the 1619 project, include the Patriot 1776 project um, that was established by Betsy DeVos, who was uh, the Secretary of Education under uh, President Donald Trump. And then we also see this sort of clash over the teaching of critical race theory, which is a, um, a, a, an instance of, of, of theory in which was been positioned by, or I guess, advanced by Gloria Ladson Billings, among others, uh, that privileges uh, race as, as a precursor for um, thinking about how we, uh, how things have been institutionalized here in the United States. Uh, and so we've seen instances such as House Bill 580 in Tennessee that, uh, that restricts the teaching of critical race theory in Tennessee and in uh, places like Texas and other states as well. As for the international um, context, you might ask, well, why South Africa and why the Caribbean, right? These are also areas that have undergone um, colonialism in the case of South Africa, where settlers moved into the area and resided there and established Ex, um, power systems economically, politically, and socially in the context of the Caribbean, while it was not settled in the same way, um, in that individuals often governed from Euro European countries, specifically Britain, um, they still went through the whole process of being colonized, right, being subjugated, of um, having the territory claimed by the colonizers. And as the many of the Caribbean um, countries were garnering their independence, which was a global phenomenon as well around the 1960s or so, um, they sought to, as part of the transition to independence, um, reimagine and restructure and really think about what the education system should look like, right? So what are the inherited institutional um, 
education systems that were um, established by the colonial forces. And now that they are newly independent, what are the ways in which um, education can then help to transform the society and the society itself help to transform education? So what we'll look at are a number of scholars, Caribbean scholars that paved the way and advocated and established visions of what the education system post-colonialism, meaning during the independent phases of these countries should look like much of which um, South African scholars, specifically since 2000, 2015, but especially after um, apartheid ended in 1994, um, sought to emulate and build upon. So we're seeing currently a move, an active movement within South Africa among scholars, among educators, specifically among students that are agitating for and building on some of the groundwork that were what was already established by some of these scholars, Caribbean scholars and educators. And so why? Why it matters in the context of the United States is that it allows us to really contextualize the US within this broader discussion of decolonization. Sometimes um, as, it, as it happens, conversations around even um, racial inequities in the context of the United States are focused so much on solving US issues that we fail to see um, the global reach that is um, colonialism and um, the ways in which even outside of the context of the United States, these um, unsavory residual legacies persist even today. And what are the ways then that we can look outwardly in terms of finding solutions or likely solutions to these problems? And one of the lessons that we will hammer, hammer home on today is the ways in which the we address the we have to address the historical underpinnings that allow for the reinforcement of systemic violence and that is fundamentally embedded in systems of education So both the methodologically, we, we, we try to look at cases like, like the United States, because of course, one of the first question is, well, why should we look at these countries? They're nothing like the US. Um, Jamaica is but a tiny little speck in our eyes, right? Um, but all of these cases, South Africa, English speaking Caribbean also, um, experience colonialism, albeit sometimes in different form, nonetheless with the same end result and the same undergoing similar processes. And in as much as we can look at their decolonizing efforts, therefore, that can inform similarly what's happened in the United States in terms of how colonialism has played out there. So we believe that lessons from the Carib English speaking Caribbean, specifically post apartheid South Africa, um, um, specifically how they address the secular colonial past, their inherited colonial structures, and the strategies and approaches that they've used to reimagine um, in their post, in their decolonizing stages, um, in their decolonizing efforts, how they are, um, with, they can be used to inform um, U.S. educators as to how we here can also similarly seek to decolonize our U.S. education system. So some of the terms that we uh, incorporate in our work is uh, Polly Morgan's 1996 conceptualization of the settler coin model, which was expanded upon by Dixon in 2019. And what this really does is that it really shines a light on this sort of um, idea that colonialism has this sort of residual effects, lasting effects, even though colonialism has not even though colonialism has ended, right? So the sort of idea, the sort of residual legacies that um, systems of equality that uh, espouse both privilege and oppression, privilege for the colonizers and settler colonialists and oppression for the uh, indigenous populations and those that have been colonized. Um, so what this, what we think about as far as like settler colonialism and the settler coin model, as far as education is using uh, Eurocentric uh, hegemonic um, epistemological norms, such as what languages are privileged, right? So the sort of Queen's English that uh, Louise Bennett, that Shan will talk about here in a second, uh, the sort of uh, Americanized standard English, uh, are processes in which uh, are used to exclude uh, individuals that have been historically marginalized uh, from uh, access to cultural and social capital. Right, so this is used to tell the story again, or to the call here is to refocus 
um, or we center focus on a the role of the disadvantage, which is often disappeared from the history, um, the retelling of our history. Um, so who are the these oppressed groups? Um, how have they contributed to society? Um, and what are the, the, the systems or systems, systems in place that allow for their reinforcement at the bottom of the social hierarchical structures? And also um, what, what tends to happen is a disappearing in the language about who generally benefits. So as Doug just pointed out, right, the narrative around um, indigenous societies, it's, oh, they are impoverished because they don't want to work hard, right, without really focusing on what are some of those historical systems and structures in place that are facilitated and reinforced systems of inequalities. Um, so when we're thinking about uh, the decolonization project, at the core of that is what colonialism is. And we just want to point out that while we tend to think of it as physically capturing land, it is simply not limited to that, right? So a part of colonialism is the territorialization. Yes, the capturing of land and territory and claiming victory and hoo-ha, um, and the subjugation of specific individuals or groups that includes indigenous populations, or in the case of African-Americans in the context of the United States, um, the black population, Africans in um, the case of South Africa, um, um, African descendants in the case of the Caribbean, um, right? So the subjugation of these individuals at the will of those colonialists who are either settlers or organizing settler, former settler societies. And um, the, 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 the structure that is established politically, economically, and also importantly, culturally, and we're emphasizing the cultural component here, right? The benefits to the settler co colonial um, society, right? Um, that those benefits then um, become normalized and embedded and reinforced as systems that, oh, they should just simply be. Um, and unless we recognize the, how grounded these are in Eurocentric norms and beliefs in Western hegemonic norms, cultural norms um, that, seeks to classify um, 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 or, or, or establish hierarchical structures, again, economically, politically, and socially, um, we don't necessarily have the ability to fully confront and address right, some of these systemic norms. So uh, as, as Emily read in, the, in our um, abstract, the notion that we can actually achieve systematic changes with all of the emphasis on anti-racism and decolonialism at the intellectual level, um, that that can result in significant systemic change is a notion that we believe needs to be challenged, right? Because it's not necessarily focused on what fundamentally needs to be transformed. And the idea that transformation or meaningful transformation will not occur unless we identify what is at the core of that, that what allows for and facilitates this reinforcement, or more specifically, the role that education systems of education, inherited colonial educational systems um, facilitate. So what are the ways in which we can then utilize current trends with move towards anti-racism, um, but also embrace views on decolonization as a an intellectual process, but also more specifically as a global geological geopolitical process. So the seller, so the one of the big differences between settler societies and uh, colonial societies is that settler societies are are established through the sort of indigenous land theft in which has normalized the sort of settler or the European um, presence within that particular entity. So what the settler society education does is that in both um, in both the the uh, English-speaking Caribbean, uh, South Africa, and as well as the United States and Canada, is that it normalizes British and European colonialism. Uh, and then also not only normalizing that sort of process of colonialism, but normalizes the sort of tool of colonialism, which is the language. So in this instance, English is privileged um, and, uh, and as well as Afrikaans in, in, South, in South Africa. Um, and then how do we, we, we believe that sort of this, this, uh, this idea around resisting colonialism through a decolonizing project that privileges anti-racism which is actively engaging racism in a way that we resist it, acknowledging that racism exists and 
looking towards the South, Carib or South African and Caribbean scholars such as Marcus Garvey, Franz Fanon, Stuart Hall, Walter Rodney and Louis Bennett and Eric Williams as uh, bastions of decolonizing processes of, of, of that we can hopefully think about their processes both um, institutionally, socially and culturally as ways to resist colonialism here in the United States. Yeah, and, and just to reinforce again, this idea that um, if we think about the emergence of even some of our most Ivy League institutions in the context of the United States, like the Harvard project or whatever, they primarily focus on establishing and reinforcing some of those cultural hegemonic norms, right? Um, that again is embedded in Eurocentrism that creates that social hierarchical structure around language, around politics, who has power and who should have power. And even in terms of education, establishing systems of education that excluded for a really long period of time, marginalized communities, right? So we have a quote in our, our piece that says these institutions were not created. These inherited, early inherited um, uh, US um, educational institutions were not created for the subjugated, right? Um, they were created primarily to reinforce settler colonialism, the territorialization, the subjugation of a people. And so if that's embedded in the origins of our early um, educational system, then addressing that um, requires that we um, that we pay attention to that and we find solutions. Like right? there's a saying that how a problem is framed <laughs> right, sets the boundary for how we think about solutions. And so if that problem is framed as, oh, it's these individuals and these um, systems of um, uh, in inequities that emerge, I don't know, in 2020, we are missing a core part of that. And so a part of what we're trying to do here is to bring attention to how, for example, Caribbean educators and scholars like Marcus Garvey, um, uh, uh, Stuart Hall, uh, Walter Rodney, Louise Bennett, Eric Williams, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, about three of these, not all of them, like we would be here all night for that, but um, specifically we'll be talking about Walter Rodney, Louise Bennett, and Eric Williams' work, who early on really sought to ask the question, now that we are um, independent, how can we then take this inherited educational system that is built um, to or established to reinforce settler colonial no norms to better suit the needs and to, to bring attention to um, the, 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 the telling of the story of the people, of the marginalized peoples from that region, and also the contribution that they have made economically and politically um, globally to the, to the world, um, right? So uh, most of you are familiar, maybe not, I don't know, um, but you should at least be familiar with Franz Renan's work, um, you know, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, um, Marcus Garvey's movement and call for attention to um, the treatment of African Americans and Black folks in the diaspora in general. Um, and But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to focus mostly on the work of Eric Williams, um, Louise Bennett, and Walter Rodney. So we're going to start with the last on the list, which is Eric Williams. And just to give a brief background, I mean, he looks super cool in that sunglasses from back in the day. Um, but this <laughs> Eric Williams, um, Died in 1981. Let's start there. He grew up in Port of Spring, um, Spain, um, which is in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, he was educated at Ivy League um, Oxford University, gaining his PhD in 1938, and has known as a renowned Caribbean historian and Pan-Africanist activ activist. And this was largely before even becoming the Prime Minister um, of um, Trinidad and Tobago. So. He, for example, used his um, research as um, being among the marginalized communities who were seeking to agitate for independence, but also reformulating or reimagining education or what education should look like in a post-colonial, in a decolonized Caribbean territory, um, right? So Eric Williams has laid quite a bit of the visionary groundwork for um, the kind of um, um, work that was done within the Caribbean, within the classroom from K through K-12 K through um, to the university levels. And we're going to hear more about that in a little bit. So we, we thought that this quote really stood out to us as far as Eric Williams's work and education in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and I'll read it um, 
education in the modern world is more than anything else, education of the people themselves as to the necessity of viewing their own education as part of their democratic privileges and their democratic responsibilities. As is the teacher, so is the school. And we think this is so profoundly um, emblematic of Eric Williams' work, um, this sort of idea around what does it mean to be democratic, to be truly democratic. And it starts with education. And who better to know the education of the, the Caribbean people than the Caribbean people themselves, right? The sort of idea that the British uh, colonizers should be dictating to uh, the people of Trinidad, Tobago, Jamaica, uh, the, the Caribbean in general was so appallingly terrible to Eric Williams that he, in Trinidad and Tobago, made it one of his life's work to uproot that sort of colonial system. And so what we think about Eric, oh, sorry. Um, so what Eric Williams does is that he really reimagines education uh, as, his, as the prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago and really thinks about this sort of idea around equitable access. And equitable access as far as uh, in both um, the, the K-12 and also post-secondary um, uh, institutions means not only equitable access to who gets to go to school, but also the sort of content that is being delivered in that particular school setting. And so what is being delivered in the school setting is that the citizens of the Caribbean, their content, their lived experience, their history is being front and center as far as what is being important and elevated to the point of prominence within this, the system um, uh, uh, under Eric Williams' um, tenure. Uh, and then I, the idea around this is that it, it, it's not only just the K through 12 education system, but really has to take place in the higher education system as well. And so Eric Williams cuts ties uh, from Great Britain from the University of West Indies. Um, and then also takes place as far as like the sort of idea around creating this sort of linear path in which decolonizing education is happening both in kindergarten all the way through primary school grades and then creates a sort of junior junior school or junior junior high school system to make that transition um, uh, to meet the needs of the students to make that transition from primary school to secondary school as well yeah, and he was very fundamental to the establishment of um, the university, the UWI, UWI as, as it's called, um, even as, 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 a, as, a, as a university in a, in, in a now an independent Caribbean area that's supposed to facilitate the learning of the people of the region, um, they, it was still primarily under the auspice of University of London. And Eric William was like, no, 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 we cannot claim to be independent and we cannot reimagine re education if at the highest level or university that, 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 that functions as the tool for not decolonization, but reinforcing Eurocentric norms cannot get the, the results that we need, which is a reimagined education that A, confronts the past um, um, in a way that is truth to um, what the experiences were for the marginalized and oppressed peoples and also acknowledging their contribution to the overall growth and development and industrialization of the world and three that allows for the disappearing of those who of the narrative of those who benefit and at what means right and so um he did this really kind of authoritative and if you think about it means of like okay you we administrators you're not doing it right let me step in i am going to run for chancellor and i'm going to win and then i'm going to establish these systems that allow for things like public education and to identify areas where um the curriculum is addressed that gets at exactly the re the proper telling or the correct telling or retelling of the histories of the region and the contributions of the people and sometimes in their own language language. The other scholar, um, and so one of the contributions um, of Eric Williams, um, just to wrap that up, is it, he's calling for decolonization, not only in terms of, right, gaining independence in the region, which he was, as you said, a Pan-Africanist, so he was also an, a, a fervent um, advocate for the independence of the region, um, pretty much kicking the British out, um, essentially, and establishing a um, independent sovereign nations that get to make their own decisions reflective of the peoples that people that uh, the population of that area. Um, and so he called for not for the exercise of decolonization to sit in that 
intellectual realm, right? But to actually, even at the highest level in terms of the educational system, the university um, should be reflected and peopled by scholars who look like the people that they're seeking to teach, who challenge those Eurocentric norms through the curriculum that allows for then individuals who didn't previously have access to education to have a means and access to the proper telling of the history of the region, the contribution of the region that results in finding or paving a way forward. So he was really instrumental to informing how, what that vision of a reimagined decolonizing um, um, uh, British Caribbean should look like. Uh, Louise Bennett followed in um, Eric Williams footsteps um, in many ways, although her focus was largely on more cultural identity components. So around, again, the area of independence, um, there was the feel like uh, uh, Doug talked about this earlier, that the Queen's English was the Queen, um, obviously not a king. So the Queen, the highest standard, and that even individuals within the Caribbean who were sitting exams were sitting exams that were a created and graded by individuals in Europe, right? Um, that they had to write in that language and what was constituted proper language. Um, and and a much of that missed the cultural um, storytelling and the rich history um, that allowed for um, that area to emerge. So uh, what Louise Bennett actually did was to call attention to what um, the, she calls it a stifling British English tends to miss in the kind of storytelling of the history of the, of the region, of the resistance of the region that the language um, sp sp spoken throughout, largely throughout the English speaking Caribbean is an amalgam of all of the various languages, indigenous peoples, African peoples, those who came from India, all of that mixed up to create as a form of resistance, a language that all could communicate in, right? And so what are the stories and the cultural components that are missed when we sterilize, as she puts it, the language to report or even write a sonnet in the Queen's English. What are the what are the cultural contexts that get, get, get missed here? And so she advocated for the Caribbean to write in their language, their, 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 the language of their mother tongue, and to be proud of that, that there's pride in that, that there's identity in that. And that also is a way of telling the story of what really happened to the marginalized um, people peoples and to have this not just as an alternative focus on language, but to identify it as equal to English, um, the Queen's English, so to speak, as a way of communicating what are the lived experiences of marginalized peoples. So she was primarily focused on then the issue of linguistic decolonization, um, right? Not privileging or putting in a hierarchical structure um, which language should be at the top medium on others. And we see this in the calls for, again, in South Africa for um, um, decolonizing the focus on language away from a, 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 um, Afrikaans or English, um, British English in that instance, but to recognize the value of African um, tongue, um, 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 different African languages, um, and as equal to others, not as less than or um, ranked lower than or good enough for African, but on equal grounds with other languages that are um, established. So um, Louise Bennett, for example, highly advan advanced the idea that language itself is that means by which we um, transmit culture. And so when individual groups or marginalized peoples are not able to tell their stories or relate their history in their own um, cultural tongue, for example, then a lot of the contexts and the experiences and the memories, the stories that get told get lost by by the way. And so language itself should be decolonized um, 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 within these societies. And there is a way to do that without necessarily posing a threat to, right, but acknowledging the need to challenge the assumption that any one language is more, is better than, or more, should be more dominant than others. Um, so um, there was obviously backlash, not just by those in Britain, British educators, but also even in the Caribbean. And I want to point to this um, um, by saying that generally we think of marginalized communities as the only ones who are resistant. And I like to remind us that 
even marginalized groups grew up in these cultural hegemonic um, societies that absorb these assumptions about what is good and what is bad. And so some of the pushback that Louise Bennett got um, in terms of writing her poetry, her storytelling in the language of the region was her was a claim about her bastardizing the English language, right? Um, there were resistance in the school of teaching her, her poetry, um, her stories, introducing them at the um, ordinary um, level, which pretty much GCE ordinary levels and A levels are just um, equivalents of like SATs within the context of the United States. You have to take these tests to get into tertiary education um, systems, right? Or schools. Um, tertiary institutions. Um, and so um, there was a resistance for quite a long time um, of teaching her work at those in those formal classroom settings. So we'd like to switch gears um, and, and talk about Walter Rodney. And Walter Rodney was born in Guyana and graduated from the University of London, which is the premier university for economics in the UK. Um, and his work, um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa in 1972 is, is essentially the cutting edge of, of the quantitative revolution. And the quantitative revolution is this uh, idea around social, that was a flurry in social sciences that, that mathematics and economics could be used as a form of resistance and, and social change in the social sciences. And um, for Walter Rodney, um, um, the sort of idea around um, the, the central thesis is that slavery is the vehicle for which industrialization drives the drives sort of colonization and sort of the sort of the sort of forces in which Europe is able to expand control into North America and 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 provide this sort or in, enroll people into this sort of colonizing process. Um, so he, he, what he dismantles is this sort of idea that Liverpool and Amsterdam don't just erupt out of nowhere. They erupt on the sort of labor on the backs of Africans that are enslaved. And so um, what is happening at this particular moment in time is that there's this sort of, uh, in South Africa, uh, it's the sort of decolonization efforts that Walter Rodney is also uh, uh, facing against this sort of backlash is this sort of idea around uh, racialized uh, segregated schools. So the Bantu Education Act in 1953 uh, segregated schools in South Africa, and they've remained segregated through 1996 with the passing of the South African Schools Act. Mm -hmm. um, and a part of that, just to jump in, a part of that then was the reinforcement of the social hierarchical structures, right? So we know that the um, racial segregation, like the predominantly Black schools would get less quality, lower quality, um, access to, to, to classroom material, um, and that the, those institutions that would gain access to better um, course material, for example, or better professors or instructors or teachers or whatnot, um, would be the ones that were close in proximity to either British or, 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 or Afrikaans, right? And so it was even through education, we see the reinforcement, the segregation as a means of reinforcing um, those early colonial um, structures of power, right? And Walter Rodney is simply bringing attention to um, a again, who are the individuals who have contributed in general to the industrialization process. And he focuses research on um, Britain, but this was not unique to Britain. He was talking broadly about European benefits, and that includes European and North American benefits, right? So if we think about the southern states that benefited um, generally, that grew up um, around the um, the economic benefits of slavery, for example, much like Liverpool, much like Amsterdam did, right? Um, he's pointing to, well, these are major contributions made by um, enslaved peoples and at a consequence as the title of his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, right? He does a forensic accounting of the ways in which African countries or African territories at the time lost the population needed um, to, 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 to advance their own development and that those were 
for stolen labor and therefore stolen, stolen economic development opportunities from these African territories that were then used to privilege and benefit um, European um, um, societies, um, set, European settler society, societies as well. And without recognizing that, um, the ways in which then those systems become reinforced in meaningful ways um, through our education system, we don't have the means to, to begin to, to address these issues. So South Africa um, um, has um, been building on some of uh, Rodney's legacy. Rodney's legacy built on Eric Williams's work, obviously. So we're kind of doing a chronological development here, although not necessarily um, like firmly so. Uh, but in the case of South Africa, much of the work or agitation around um, dismantling the pedagogy of big lies, as one of the piece um, talks about, is how to a um, address or acknowledge the uh, contribution of marginalized communities within South Africa. And those marginalized communities happen to be the vast majority of South African population, right? So black South African, indigenous South Africans constitute the majority of that society. And yet as the, the education system, segregated education system um, that existed from 1936 all the way to 1996 allowed for a very multi-tiered system where individuals who were native Africans, for example, South Africans were not allowed the same access to um, its higher better quality um, um, institutions, a higher level institutions, colleges, universities. And also when they did get in, they faced um, 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 high fees that they have to pay that the government did nothing or very little to offset those costs for those individuals. Um, that means that more, fewer and fewer of these individuals are actually graduating from these elite institutions or gaining access to these elite institutions. And so there was a call again for um, tuition freezes by generally agitation around um, students who are making these calls to those in positions of power to on freeze, um, to freeze tuition, um, provide for the government to provide um, tuition, better tuition aid for those individuals who do qualify for these positions. And um, a, a one step further, the students sought to use the work of Eric Williams and specifically Walter Rodney in calling attention to the need to um, challenge those Eurocentric norms that are being taught within the system of education, right? So uh, disciplines his, such as history, um, uh, political science, philosophy, were all still related to or dependent on um, or called from um, primarily Western European um, um, educators or scholars. And a lot of what's built in there, again, are um, these assumptions about who um, who gets to tell the story of South African, South Africa in whose language and um, without necessarily identifying, acknowledging again, the contributions of indigenous populations and really challenging the, the ways in which we come to know things, right? So we talk about epistemologies, calling for the need to agitate and question, is that there's a European or Western European way, the only way to know things? Well, are there equivalents in the case of African um, epistemologies that can be focused that we can learn from? And what are those things and why are they not given the equal, uh, at least equal say or, uh, or um, uh, um, equal access or equal time um, within the um, equal place within the educational um, systems. So in, in our piece, we, we really like to emphasize the idea that decolonization is a process. It, it falls on a sort of continuum. There's no there there with decolonization. Um, and the, the Caribbean and South Africa have, have experienced backlash. Um, in 2020, the Jamaica Supreme Court case uh, that ruled against uh, ch uh, children wearing locks and, and were uh, barred from school. Same thing with South Africa. Uh, students were, were expelled from school for, for, for having natural hair. Um, there's instances in which backlash occurs. It's not just like this sort of linear progression that oftentimes we learn about in history class that like things are always progressing. That's a totally Western normative idea of history. There's always a sort of there's instances of resistance, even in, in instances 
such as the Caribbean and South Africa that have been undergoing this sort of decolonizing process. Um, but what, what we, we believe um, is that the Caribbean and South Africa can serve for models for having a dialogue around decolonization. Um, examples of institutional change in which uh, the institution of, 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 of University of West Indies, um, the, the utilization of, of Caribbean scholars, Caribbean languages uh, within the school of, uh, within the University of West Indies is huge. Um, examples of social change, such as Louise Bennett's idea around uh, what languages get privileged and why, and really confronting the idea around the Queen's English and uh, using uh, indigenous languages as, 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 as equal to value as the Queen's English is critically important. And then finally, thinking about Walter Rodney's cultural change and thinking about the shifting of the way in which we look at historiography and whose, um, whose history gets told at what amplitude, uh, what instances of resistance and backlash get told um, are critically important. Yeah, and so our point is not that the Caribbean or South Africa are perfect examples of decolonization, right? Um, but that, that decolonization is itself a, pro a process in that um, there are, um, we believe, um, areas of, 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 of efforts or areas of improvement that um, are yet to register in the United States. So there's something to be learned from these cases. We're not, however, advocating that these are perfect cases that have achieved decolonization, whatever actually that means. And so what we'd like to re-emphasize re is that coming back to the United States is that the United States is an education system based upon settler colonialism. Uh, in the case of historiography, it's still based, uh, largely based in, in K-12 schools based upon a George Bancroftian model in which the founding fathers have achieved like a sort of apotheosis state in which George Washington, um, James Madison, uh, Thomas Jefferson can do no wrong. And I think it's kind of a shock to thought when a lot of students get to uh, either encounter a critical pedagogue in high school or in middle school and elementary school, or encounter a critical pedagogue in college that confronts these, I, these colonial legacies. It's a shock to thought. Uh, it's definitely something that uh, Pearson and McGraw-Hill definitely don't have on their agenda. Um, but, uh, and so what we'd like to think about is this sort of resistance um, in the form of anti-racism, the idea that racism exists and to actively combat racism as a daily task um, is, is what we believe that what is happening in the Caribbean and South Africa is happening, uh, could be happening here as well. And then also thinking about civic responsibility and critical race theory. Um, what we've seen is, is these sort of instances of resistance um, have also in the United States have a form of backlash. Uh, so with the back, Black Lives Matter movement, in the, um, which started in the 2014 or 2013, and then uh, had a critical emergence in 2020, uh, there was a, an, a backlash around All Lives Matter. And then, like I said uh, earlier in the talk, uh, the banning of critical race theory in a lot of, uh, in, in many of our states. And so we, we're at the point where we, um, and we want to make it clear that we're not saying these are the only um, recommendations that we give or lessons that can be gleaned from um, um, the, studying the cases of South Africa and the Caribbean, um, but we pretty much called the ones that we thought might be most useful here. Um, these are also not, we don't pretend to that these are unique or novel concepts. Um, they're familiar with some of us, um, but we would like to give examples for how they actually function within the context of either the Caribbean or um, South Africa. And um, also the idea around that this is um, decolonization has, has occurred in the United States as far as intellectual processes, such as the freedom movement uh, in Mississippi in the 1960s, where uh, students from Hayettesburg, Mississippi uh, called on uh, the United States government to, uh, as a de declaration of independence of Hayettesburg, Mississippi, uh, declaring that they were, um, that the United States government was not adhering to the sort of Brown v. Board promise that they had uh, espoused and that they demanded a sort of critical education that they, des that they rightfully deserved and that the Supreme Court justices had, had, uh, had, had said that they were entitled to, and yet they were still not receiving the services that they were entitled or uh, in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And so one of the 
can we go back one more? Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> one of the, the things that we talk about in the piece is teach beyond the textbook. Um, and that simply is asking for us to get beyond the Pearson, like the, the idea of um, these fabricated textbooks that actually then informs how an instructor teaches their class, like specifically K through 12, um, right? And so teaching by the textbook kind of limits and without thought of who is writing this textbook, what benefits does this, um, whom, to, whom, whom does it benefit, um, who, whose story gets left out, um, right? We advocate for, like in the Caribbean case, um, teaching beyond the textbook. If we think about Williams um, back in the 1960s when the Caribbean was gaining its independence, many of the Caribbean countries were gaining their independence, um, right? The textbooks were all saying um, really mistruths about what were the experiences and the contribution of people from that region. It was highly advancing a uh, telling of history that missed out in the case of Walter Rodney, right? What at what loss to the African population and the diaspora, and right, and the story about who gets to benefit from all of this economically, and establish a system where those stories are simply disappeared. And so, without actual textbooks that were written from the perspective of the historically marginalized groups, um, they had to reach out and um, find different ways of getting that information within the curriculum to the students that they could better understand and have a nuanced understanding of the history of the of the of the area that in many ways challenge some of the stories that are told in the formal textbooks that were previously assigned. Um, so we are saying in the context of the, um, the United States that in as much as we can acknowledge that some of these textbooks are um, written and portray a specific perspective in telling and that some of the stories of the indigenous peoples or the marginalized groups within the context of the United States, that one thing that we can seek to do as instructors or teachers within the classroom is to find those alternative means of getting away from getting beyond going beyond a step further beyond what is outlined in the textbook. Did you want to share the story about um, how we came to talk about, uh, even, even within the context of doing um, this research, one of the questions was, um, and that this gets at critically evaluating whose voices are marginalized among the historically marginalized, right? Um, so in, in, in the context of doing decolonization work, there is no one definition of what constitutes a state of decolonization, which is why for the for this project, we emphasize that by decolonization, we regard it as both an intellectual exercise, but also a global phenomenon and one that is made up of multiple processes, right? Um, it is not one endpoint. And so there are scholars, and I'll give the example of um, the within um, um, some uh, indigenous um, circles, the idea of decolonization occurs only in as much as land is repatriated to the indigenous peoples, right? Like decolonization does not happen unless there is a return of land to the people. In the context of the Caribbean, um, right, and why we tend to emphasize the need to broaden our focus a little bit globally is within that conversation, much of those island states that um, the indigenous populations were nearly extinct in the 1500s, for example, uh, like who are we talking about repatriating land to in this context? And so what could decolonization as a process entail outside of returning land? It could be one of the components, but should it be considered the only component that we talk about having achieved decolonization? So when we say critically evaluate, we should always be thinking about who's who even among the marginalized groups, whose stories are being left out, who, who what, what are the contexts that gets, um, that, that the process um, um, does not fully um, embrace or explain um, what is happening. And so looking at the Caribbean and South Africa as good examples help us to amplify or bring attention to the the ways in which having too narrow a story of the um, of, of, of the impact of colonialism and marginalized peoples can have if we don't take a broader, more globalized um, um, perspective. Oh. So in closing, 
uh, what we'd really like to think about is, is this sort of idea around drawing them on the momentum of the Caribbean and South Africa to challenge Eurocentric norms and, 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 and think about the sort of idea around teaching the teaching of marginalized peoples to not just one day or one month in a tokenistic way, but how do we incorporate their voices year round in the schools, right? Um, and so in, by incorporating their voices year round in the schools, we're moving beyond this sort of metaphorical wokeness test, right? So instead of saying, instead of saying well, we talked about indigenous people on one day, on October 11th, we can, we can now move on, right? It, but in reality, what we should be doing is talking about indigenous people all year round, right? And so we have to move, in order to move forward, we have to adopt a, 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 adopt a system of anti-racism and equitable democratic practices. Thank you all. And now if you have questions for us, we'll be happily um, address them. Awesome, thank you. Yes, if anyone has any questions or comments, please put them in the chat. Um, there is a Q&A feature as well. So we'll just kind of give folks a moment if they have any questions for the two of you. And we know sometimes coming up with questions on the spot is a little difficult. So we're gonna do an uncomfortable pause. We're all gonna be okay at the end of it, but just so folks can have time to process. Malona put in the chat, thank you. That was really informative and interesting. Thank you. Thank you. This is more of a, a comment than a question, but I'm curious if um, you two saw the article that came out, I think it was from the New York Times about a month ago, but it was talking about how our education system and education policy has never actually ever centered nor included research about how folks learn or about how we like receive or take in information, which I think is kind of an interesting piece that I think fits really well into this decolonization conversation. Um, because I think it, it, at least to me, I, you know, just thinking about your talk is demonstrating that our education system wasn't I, it wasn't actually built for educating. It wasn't built for actually assisting people with learning or gaining knowledge, um, which I think is, is kind of interesting. I have a question in the chat too. Um, do you want me to read it, Kaden? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, uh, Wayne said, not sure how to frame this, a, di a dialogue around decolonizing education and incorporating marginalized voices makes sense. However, the challenge is that, is that would assume folks who want to have that dialogue. As you indicated, we are currently dealing with intentional political pressures on particular sides that push directly against this type of dialogue, causing extraordinary challenges, promoting educational systems that forward a patriotic education and counter, and counter lessons that divide Americans on race and slavery and teach students to hate their own country. How do we combat these type, this type of rhetoric and these efforts to further politicize education? Just like a simple question for you too, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's it. I mean, that's a good question. And I, my first question to the question is, who are folks? Like, like, so if like, challenges that we assume folks, like, who are the folks that we're talking about? Right? Like, like, who gets to determine who, 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 who gets to do the one who gets to determine who gets included, who gets left out, and we need to then ask further question about who has historically been included and who has historically been left out. And so is the issue necessarily that individuals by calling attention to, hey, they're historically marginalized peoples, 
right, who have contributed to the development of this country. And we should A, acknowledge the difficulties that they experienced and B, acknowledge the contributions that they made and C, recognize the benefits that we have had based on those experiences. Um, why should we not learn that? Why should that be a politically divisive or focusing on the history of slavery, much of which we're saying, even the educational system that was established were based on and grounded in, like many of the elites institutions today are advancing. They were, they, they were, there was land taken from indigenous peoples that were never paid for. They had, they were built on literally on the backs of enslaved peoples. And yet, right, um, not individuals that for generations right, even today are only accepted at very minimal levels. And yet talking about that, addressing those things, bringing attention to those things are deemed to be um, political. I think we need to acknowledge and realize that what are the ways in which our educational system gets us to think in that specific way, right? How can we as educators encourage individuals to think critically about how even the, 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 the type of education that you're exposed to, what gets discussed, what does not get discussed, help you to frame your very setting, um, the, the very framework in which you're posing the question in terms of how can we then move beyond what currently exists. And I think um, in, in the context of the Caribbean, uh, um, right in the 1960s, that was not easy for individuals or visionaries like Eric Williams to do. Right to go up against the British mighty system, systems that were established, that that were firmly entrenched, and yet the idea was to take meaningful, intentional efforts to a right acknowledge the heart. But do you want to stay in a in 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 a, in, in a setting where individuals are simply bitter at the British for what they experienced? That was not at all the goal. The goal is a we acknowledge what we experience. B we acknowledge the contributions of these people. And C we imagine an education system that uh, embraces the truth, but recognize as well that that is not simply what individuals are or who they were. And a crafting the retelling of the, of, the, of the peoples of the region in a way that provides a vision of how to move forward for all folks, right? Not just those at the top. And that is a way of getting at that colonial coin that those embedded institutional systems that persist in ways that we may not even be aware of, right? We call them invisible structures. They are there nonetheless. They're those who benefit from them, they are self-reinforcing and being aware of them and acknowledging um, the ways in which they are recreated politically, socially, and otherwise is important if we are going to have meaningful systemic change. Are there some that don't want change? Obviously, yes. Um, but who are the folks that we talk about? And I'd like to echo what Shan says. I, I think this sort of idea around politicizing this idea of what justice is, is unjust. Elevating the voices of the marginalized is just. And to, to not do so is injustice. Um, and so I think around this sort of idea, this, this plays out, you know, I looked at the, uh, the 2020 Tennessee Blue Book when I was doing my research for, uh, in Chattanooga. And it still had these horrific images of uh, per, per, portraying the Cherokee and Creek in, uh, uh, nations as, as uh, killing uh, farmers on, on, that were just farming. And that's absolutely atrocious. That is totally unjust. And so the idea around what is justice and who gets to say what is just I don't think that should be a political statement. I think that the idea around elevating, to, to do justice to the injustice is to elevate the voices of those that have been marginalized, recognizing the sort of um, contributions that they have made, while at the same time discussing the sort of resistances to, uh, um, the, the resistances to, um, to, to systemic and, and, and physical violence is, is critical. Mm-hmm. 
and, and I just want to bring us back to like South Africa is a good case here, right? Um, so even if we can't understand, because sometimes it's easier to understand a case that's not the country in which we live. And so like this is 2015 that like majority Africans, indigenous peoples whose lands were taken by the um, um, Afrikaans and the British, um, who the, the what is it, less than around two to five percent of the um, um, non indigenous population in South Africa are the ones that own all the wealth. And so how are the way, what are the ways in which culturally, um, right, who gets into the top institutions? What must you do? What, what, what language must you be able to write in? And here are students, majority of whom are, again, indigenous Africans who are saying, hey, right, what about us? We are the folks here, um, right? Like the telling of um, the Shaka Zulu story of the fighting and resistance against um, the British and, 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 and the Af Af Afrikaans, for example, um, um, is not as written in our textbooks. Right? We have been told the stories over and over through oral history, what we learn from our, what about the value of those in terms of how we view ourselves as individuals? What about our um, 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 version of the history, including the horrific things that we have experienced at the hands of colonizers? That is a story that is now deeply embedded in the history that is South Africa. And to not acknowledge that is, is, is to not acknowledge or understand um, the the ways in which then power structures get built and reinforced um, in a ways that are not necessarily beneficial to, in that case of South Africa, the majority of the population. It was a good question. Thank you. Yeah, and Wayne shared in the chat that he um, completely agreed and appreciated your response. So. I think we'll do a last call out for any final questions or comments before we wrap things up tonight. And just to just get, maybe I can add just a little bit like one of the reasons why we chose South Africa and the Caribbean English speaking Caribbean again is um, oftentimes again you will hear oh the United States is unique right and so we want to again point to colonialism as a global um, um, that's something that happened globally. It had real global reach, um, right? The repercussions that we're seeing today, we only have to look at the news and what's happening in Ukraine and who is allowed into Poland and who is not, right? These are not things that are unique to the United States. This was a global phenomenon that affected multiple countries. And in as much as you can find English speaking countries that A, had settler societies as South Africa did like the United States, um, like the, in the case of the, the Caribbean, um, some parts were settled colonized other parts where they colonize from a distance that's fine nonetheless the um the outcome was primarily the same there were individuals who were subjugated, um, who held marginalized um, 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 status within the society, and in a way that that marginalization benefited specific groups, either within that society or in the metropole. And unless we understand and, uh, and, 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 and address the underpinnings of where that reinforcement occurs, where even today in 2015, um, individuals in South African societies um, are not, um, have to, are not gaining the same access to levels of education um, as others, it's a minority within that country, um, then we're not beginning to understand how we unravel that existing structure. Well, I just want to thank the both of you so much um, we really appreciate you being here and, and thanks for those who have attended tonight. Um, I don't know if you have any final things you want to share. Otherwise, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap things up.